Today we're going to be learning Yevama Daf Pehe, Chodesh Tov to everybody. This month's learning is sponsored by Michelle and Bill Futornik in honor of Shira's 18th birthday and high school graduation. Shira was born on Shavuot and has always been connected to Torah, especially through her more than 1,000 hours of community service in high school, the majority of which were with Friendship Circle. We are so proud of our daughter and Chavruta and the mensch that she is. Today's daf is sponsored by Michelle and Lawrence Berkowitz in loving memory of Joy Rachwag Rabalsam on the 18th year at site of her passing. Joy was a pioneer in women's Torah learning and would be so proud of Rabbanit Farber and the Hadron Project as it has provided a forum for Gemara learning for many women. And today's stuff is also sponsored anonymously, one day late, but on behalf of Memorial Day in America and in memory of all those who gave their lives to protect our freedom. Okay, we are going to now get started with our daf. We have to go back a little bit to the end of yesterday's daf. So just to review where we were up to, we're talking about this statement that Rabbi Yehuda had said in the name of Rav that was brought up in the middle of a different discussion, and they go now in depth into it, which is, can a chalala, I'm sorry, can a bat kohen, a woman whose father is a kohen, so she's basically born into a kohen family, is she forbidden or permitted to marry a halal? Right, so a disqualified kohen, right, whether usually his father married a woman he wasn't allowed to marry, he becomes a halal. Can he marry a bat kohen, or is she forbidden to marry him because she's from you know sanctity and he's halal, dis, you know not sanctified anymore? This so Rav Yehuda Paskins in the name of Rav, yes, she can marry him. There's no issue for halal. Halal doesn't have an issue at all. What's the issue? The issue is just their sons will be halalim, okay, or their daughters will be halalim, but there's no. It's not forbidden to marry. So then they tried to prove it from our Mishnah, and then they said you can't necessarily prove it from our Mishnah, our Mishnah could be interpreted otherwise. That's where we ended yesterday. And now we're going to start with about 10 lines from the bottom, Mativ Ravin Bar- Barnachman. He questions now against the Salacha, and he says, look, there's a drasha in the Pasuk. Lo yikachu, lo yikachu. Okay, here's the Pasuk I'm going to read it. Vayikra chapter 21, verse 6. Isha zona v'chalala lo yikachu. Kohen is not allowed to marry a zona or a chalala. And a woman who's divorced from a man, he cannot take. What do you notice strange in this pasuk? It should have said, Why does it say, We shouldn't take. And then, It seems very strange, repetitive. To which the Gemara says, or the Brita says, which is what Rav, this is the source that Rav Bar Nachman is quoting, to question Rav's psak. Psakalacha, he says here, it says in the Brayta, Lo yikachu, lo yikachu, the double language, milamed, al ish, that the woman is forbidden as well. What would she be forbidden? Ah, must be forbidden from marrying a halal, and that that extra lo yikachu is talking about an additional relationship that's not mentioned explicitly in the text, and that goes explicitly against what Rav says. To which the Gemara says, what are you talking about? Amar Rava, Rava comes and questions him and says, no. You misunderstood this this um, this section. What is this section coming to say? This drasha lo yikachu lo yikachu comes to say men are obligated, meaning kohanim can't marry grusha zona chalala, and likewise the women, the divorcee, the zona, the chalala, they can't marry the kohen, meaning both sides get a punishment for doing this if they do it. That's what it's coming to tell you. So then, in other words, again, it's all a matter of how you understand these words. That means, right, they thought it meant maybe she can't marry a chala. Now we say, no, 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 that's not what it means. It means that she is liable as well if she's the divorcee or she is the chalala, or, right, and she marries the coin. So that's not the same thing, right? That's something totally different. It has nothing to do with a woman marrying a chala. Now we say, wait a minute. You don't learn that from there. That's what you think you learn, that the that the grusha can't marry a coin and she's going to be liable if she does? No. That's not learned out from this drush of lo yikahu. That's learned out already from a different drasha, in which case lo yikahu can't mean that, which means the lo yikahu drasha maybe really does mean that a woman can't marry a halal, uh, a bak kohen. So how does he know this? We haven't seen yet. But am rabbi yud am rabbi, v'chein tana debe rabbi Yishmael. Okay, both, it was passed down in the name of Rav, and it was passed down in the name of a brighter from the house of Rabbi Yoshua. 
איש או אישה כי עשו מכל חטאות האדם. אוקיי, וזה זה במדבר צ'אפטר 5. It says a man or a woman who does any sin. השווה כתוב אישה לאיש לכל עונשים שבתורה. בתורה compared man and women, males and females, for all punishments in the Torah, right? We know that women have exemptions from certain things. Okay, number one, they have exemptions from time-bound commandments. Number two, once in a while, there's something that explicitly is clear. It's talking only about a man. But otherwise, we assume, without knowing otherwise, because of this pasuk, a man or a woman who sins, we're going to say, right, forget about the context, and it talks about something specific, but they're going to basically say, Isha, Isha, man or woman, is going to basically say they're equal for all punishments in the Torah. So you don't need lo yikachu and lo yikachu, the double language, to teach you man is obligated and women as well. That the, the divorcee, let's just take her for the example. The divorcee is going to also get lashes for going against this negative commandment. No, we know that already from somewhere else, which again would say that Rasha is open maybe to teach us that the woman actually is commanded not to marry a halal. A bat kohen can't marry a halal. But the Gemara says, no, not exactly. Because Ime if you just had Isha Isha, you wouldn't have necessarily known about our Pasuk. Why? Hava mean, I would have thought, Lava Shaveh Bekol. That's a general prohibition that applies to all men and therefore also applies to all women. Ava Lav Sheeno Shaveh Bekol Lo, but a limited Lo Tase. This Lo Tase is limited to Kohanim only. It's only Kohanim who can't do this. It's not the same as everything in the Torah. So you might not have thought that the women, and think about it, the, the Pasuk is really very specific toward male Kohanim cannot marry Grushot, Zonot, Chalalot. So that seems to really think, you would think that even though Ish and Isha are always got the same punishments, you know, if the woman does the same thing the man does, maybe this is a unique case. And that's why you need Lo Yikachu, Lo Yikachu. So now, Gita, your question is exactly where the Gemara is going. But what about Tum'ah? Dilav she'en shaveh b'kol. But you'll see what they're going to do with it. Okay, now, Tum'ah is something. Now, it's only a Kohen can't become impure to dead people. But, right, except for the few seven relatives, right, the very close relatives of him. But, what about, right, in this case, it's not a lav she'en shaveh b'kol. And why are women excluded? Why is it so obvious? Well, it's not so obvious. There has to be a, there's a special drasha or a special way the Torah refers to it that makes it clear it's only referring to men. So, Tama de Katavrachmana bene Aharon velo benot Aharon. The Pasuk there where it says, lo yitame, uh, lenefesh lo yitame ba'amav, that a coin can't become tame. The beginning of that verse says, God spoke to Moshe and said, emora la koanim bene Aharon. Speak to the sons of Aharon. Okay, so therefore, they learn from there, sons and not daughters. Now, what does this mean? If to be, it's a little bit tricky, the proof they're going to try to use. They're going to say now, because there was a special drasha, halav hachi, if you didn't have that, what would you have thought? And as if you need a drasha, it means that without that, what would you have thought? Havamina, nashim chayavot. You would have assumed that women, female kind, even have the same prohibition. Now, why would you have thought that? If not for the Isha Isha Pasuk, my time, Allah Mishum de Rav Yehuda Amarav, is it not because what Rav Yehuda Amarav said, Isha Isha, they're all equal and therefore you thought they were equal? In which case, that's a lav she'en o shavebekol, and you still learn it from the Pasuk Isha Isha, and therefore it sounds like you don't need lo yikahu, lo yikahu, to which they answer very simply, because it's not really the greatest question, lo digamrina mi lo yikahu. No, it's it's because you don't... Why did the Torah have to tell you B'nai Aaron? Because Isha Isha would tell you when it applies across the board. A mitzvah that applies to everybody. When it's a specific mitzvah that applies only to a particular community, you would learn that from Lo Yikachu, Lo Yikachu. Now comes in the Tuma Pasuk, and it would have been part of the unique community, which we learned already Lo Yikachu, Lo Yikachu applies to male and female alike. And therefore, you need lo yikachu to, uh, you need the tuma pasuk bnei aharon and not bnei aharon to tell you this is an exception to the rule. So we tried to use this to say why was it? Why do we need to make an exception here? Why? What would be the default? The default should have been learned from isha isha. And I said no, no, no. The default would have been learned from lo yikachu. So it's a bit of a weird question in the first place because the answer is pretty obvious. Again, 
Those two drashot build the paradigm for everything, and this one would, be, would have been like that from the lo yikahu. Some people learn this whole thing a little bit differently. That the reason why you need both is for a different reason. Or it's the same reason, but it, it, it's not, it, it came about a little in a different way. Instead of saying those two verses existed and then came the exemption of, lo, of the Tuma, you would look at it from, again, the Torah was written, right? We don't know exactly what was written first and what came first and what we're supposed to look at first. But it's kind of coming from the other perspective with the same issues. Ige da Amre, ki echa you might have thought that you need the Kicha Pasuk not because from Isha Isha you wouldn't have inferred it. You could have inferred Isha Isha applies to everything and therefore men and women would be equal. But you might have gotten confused because of one thing. What might have thrown you off guard? And this is, I think, the direction you were trying to go in Gita, which is, ah, but when it comes to Tuma, we see that the Tuma by Kohanim, Kohanim can't become impure to a dead body, that's only men. So maybe the forbidden marriages are only on the men. Kamash malan, that's why you needed lo yikahu to tell you no. Okay, so theoretically you could have really learned it from Yisho Isha. But because Tum is an exception, you might have thought this is also an exception. And therefore it comes clear, no, it's not an exception and that's why we need the verse. Okay, so those are all different reasons why, why we need the verse lo yikahu to teach that, which again, why do we bring it? Because we want to teach you the drasha lo yikahu lo yikahu when it said this, Ambiguous statement, Isham Busheret al Yidei Ha'ish, must mean the woman is forbidden just as the man is in this forbidden marriage. And then it has absolutely nothing to do with a female Kohen not, be, Kohenet not being allowed to marry a Halal, which is what we thought we brought it for in the first place as a question. What do you mean she can marry a Halal? It says she's commanded just as much as the men, which would mean she can't marry a Halal. But no, that's not what it meant. It really was talking about the divorcee marrying the coin, she's liable as well. Okay. You think we'd be done with this, and it's pretty clear a female Kohen, Kohenet as we call her, can't, uh, can, sorry, can marry a halal. But wasn't so clear still. Rav Papa, it was clearly an issue that people struggled with. In fact, I was, I was learning with my husband, and I'm a Bak Kohen, so I know all the laws about Bak Kohen pretty well. And he said to me, when we first started learning the sugi, he says a bak kohen can marry a chala. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Bak kohen can do anything. Like there's there's no forbidden on her. Like I know this because I'm a bak kohen, so I know what what has to do with me, right? So the same way he thought, oh, it would seem reasonable that she shouldn't marry a chala, but you know, like I think intuition would say that's the case. So again, you're going to have the same situation where people are really can you can't you? It was clearly a bit of a struggle. Rav Papa Rav Huna Bered Rav Yoshua Iklu Lehinsivu. Okay, they came to Hinsivu. Some people say it's Shach Nitziv, which was some place we saw before. It's considered not the greatest place, but it does, it's not really important for our purposes. Laatre Rav Idi Bar Avin. It was the place where Rav Idi Bar Avin lived. Ba'u Minayu. So they, when Rav Papa and Rav Huna came in, the son of Rav Yoshua came into town, they started questioning him. And they said, Hu Seruk Sherot Linase Lepsuli No Lo. Right? It was an obvious issue. They said, Can Benot Kohen, can they marry Chalalim or not? Amar lehu Rav Papa Tanitua, let's learn it from here. Asara yuchsun alumi, yuchsin alumi bavel, koanim levi'im v'yisraelim, chalalim, gerim v'chavurim, umamzerim, nitinim shtuke v'asufe. Let's go uh, over them, okay? And in fact, Daf Mishalahen is all about this issue of yuchsin and how we relate to it. So if you want to listen in Hebrew, it's up on our site already. And and actually going up today is Shuli Mishkin's post more, I think more about tomorrow's Daf, but about levi'im in general, which we're going to start at the end of today's Daf. Um, okay, so we have Kohanim. These are all the categories. Kohanim, Le- right? Kohanim, Levites, and Israelites. Halalim, that's our case. Gerim, converts. Halalim, those are freed slaves who become Jews. Um, mamzerim, okay, we know what a Mamzer is. Nitinim, those are the Givonim that we talked about also. Shtuki, that's someone who when they don't know who his father is. They only know who the mother is. And a Sufi is someone who you find on the street, like you gather him up from the street. It's someone, they don't necessarily have to be gathered up from the street, but someone who we don't know who their mother or their father is. That's why, right, they've been abandoned. Otherwise, usually you know who the mother is. So now, about these 10 Yuchsin that, were, that came from Babylonia when they went back to Israel, right, and they had to figure out, okay, we need to get the lineages all correct. So, they can each marry each other freely. 
Le, uh, Levi'im, Yisraelim, notice who's off this list, Kohanim is off, right? Just Le- Levites, Israelites, Chalalim, Gerim, Charurim, Mutarim, Lavo, Zebazet. So comes Rav Papa, and what does he say? Notice who's on this list. Who can marry? Uh, these people can each marry within each other. Notice Kohanim is off. That means Kohanim can't marry Chalalim, which means also female Kohanim can't marry Chalalim. That's what it seems to be implied from here. Let's just finish the source. Right, all they, all those people can marry each other. Okay, although it's not 100% true, there's some issues with the Suffolk ones marrying. We'll get into that another time. But notice here, one point is that the Gerim can marry in both. We saw that there was a machloket about that. This side's on that Gerim were not Kahal Hashem if they were called Kahal Hashem exclusively. They're not exclusively Kahal Hashem. If they were exclusively Kahal Hashem, they would not be permitted to Mamzerim. And here it says they are. So now, notice, Ilu Kohanot lo Katani, right? It doesn't say Kohanot can marry Chalalim. So it sounds like they can't. To which Rav Huna, Amar Leib, Rav Huna, Bered, Rav Yeshua, what are you talking about? Kol Hecha, Dahani, Nas Bemehani, Dahani, Nas Bemehani, Katani. Only mentioned here ones that go both ways. If right, if you would say Kano can marry Chalalim, it would only be would only be here if also Kohanim can marry Chalalot, and that for sure can. So they say right, that's why it's not listed here, but not because it's not not because they can't. They can. It's just this listed things that were equal for men and women uh, as well, and therefore I'm going um, Kohen de ilu bai le mintab chalala, sirala. Kohen can't marry a chalala, therefore lo katane. Okay, they didn't mention things that would only be for the men and not the females. So they just said, these can marry these because the, it's only when these can marry these, both males and females can marry. So they couldn't mention the females because the males can't marry. In the parallel case. Atu le kamed rav is. So basically, we have this again. It's not clear cut though because even Rav Papa thought that. The Bat Kohen can't marry a Chalal, but came Rav Huna Bereder of Yoshua, and he said they can. So now, right, you ask two rabbis and you get two answers. The people are a little bit confused. Onto the Kameder of Edi Baravin. So they go to the local rabbi and say, okay, these rabbis from the outside, they're just confusing us. Amr Lehu, he said to them, Dari Dekei, my children. I don't know if this was Lashon Chiba, like out of love, my children, or maybe even derogatory, possibly. I don't know, but I assume it was out of love. They weren't warned not to marry them, meaning you can do it. So we Paskins like we have this tradition in the name of Rav Yehuda from Rav that Benot Kohen can marry Chalali. Okay, and that is the Psach Halacha. But I wanted to point out, as I pointed out with my discussion with my husband, right, it's not an issue that was so obviously clear cut that this would be the case. Now we're going back to the Mishnah and something that wasn't very clear in the Mishnah, and unfortunately it's still going to be unclear until we get to a little bit later on. If I would have organized this Gemara, I would have started with okay, with this topic, which is we're now going to talk about the issue of Ketuba for, if you remember in the Mishnah, and we kind of maybe don't remember so well because we didn't really go through it, so I said we'll wait to the Gemara, but it said, we talked about these cases where she's permitted to one, forbidden to the other, and then we talked about the Rabbanans as well, and then we said if it's a rabbinic issue, then she gets her Ketuba. Right, the case of Shniot, which is forbidden on a rabbinic level, she I'm sorry, she doesn't get a ketuba. Okay, she she gives up her rights to the ketuba. But when it comes to the Almana, the Kohen Gadol, Gushab, Khalitza, the Kohen Yo, Mamzer, Nitina, Israel, Bab Mamzer, the Nitinu, the Mamzer, all those which are called Chayve Lavim, negative commandments from the Torah, it said Yesh la ketuba. She gets a ketuba. I want you to also notice the lack of parallel Lashon. In the Shniot, it said she doesn't get a ketuba. Not Pero, not Mizono, not Bala'o. We went through yesterday what all those things are. And here it says, in the Almanah, the Kohen Gadol, Yesh Lahen Ketuba. It doesn't make mention of anything else. So first they're going to ask a bunch of questions, and only after that are they going to get to, why is there this difference? Okay, and in fact, it's going to be a little bit confusing. There's going to be some different opinions as to why we distinguish between the two cases. So, Shniot Medivre Sofrim. First we're going to have a few questions. Ba'o Minei Bnei Berei Merav Sheshet. So this People of, of people of the city of Barry Astro of Shesh. Shniya labal velo shniya liabam. Yesh la ketuba miabam o lo. He comes up with a more complicated case. Now, Shniya doesn't get a ketuba, it says in the Torah, uh, in the Mishnah. But what if we have a case? Do you remember when a, in a normal Yibum case, what happens? The woman gets a ketuba from her first husband. Her first husband dies, but she then does Yibum with the brother. So she doesn't get a ketuba money yet. And then 
the ketuba for the second marriage of the, with the brother, the Yibo marriage is from the first husband's ketuba. And only, if you remember this, only in a case where he doesn't have money, then the second brother has to provide, the Yabam has to provide the ketuba. But generally, the Yabam doesn't provide the ketuba. It comes from the first husband. So comes the Gemara and asks a good question. We had a case where she's asura labal, but muteret liyabam. She couldn't marry her husband uh, because, remember, the, we talked about the case where it was his mother's mother, which is only forbidden on a rabbinic level. He married her, and then she felt to even to his brother who didn't have the same mother. So he, she was permitted to the yabam. She just wasn't permitted to her husband. So they asked the following question. In that case where it's forbidden for her to the husband, but not the Yabam, maybe she gets a ketubah from, this, from the Yabam. Why? Do, well, now we're going to show both sides of the question. Do we say, Since they say the whole ketubah from the Yabam comes from the first husband, and the first husband didn't give her a ketubah, then maybe she gets no ketubah here. Since in a case where the first husband doesn't have money, the second husband has to provide her with the ketubah, maybe here also it's like a case where the first husband doesn't have money because he didn't have to give her a ketubah. So maybe the second husband would have to. Okay, so that's the basic question. Let's learn it from the following source. Okay, that's so far what we learned. Right, It goes by the first husband. Ah, this right explicitly gives us an answer. It says, if she was a Shniya Labal, but not to the Yabam, right? Even from the Yabam, she doesn't get a Ketubah. So there you have it. She doesn't get a Ketubah at all because his marriage is only really based on the first. And the first, she, she didn't get a Ketubah, so she doesn't get it from this one as well. Now the Gemara just asks a side question about the language in that right. Why did it say, even mi Yabam Eila? It sounds like, they're going to say, it sounds like in this case, the Yabam wouldn't be able to, wouldn't give her, but maybe there is some case where the Yabam does give her a ketubah, even though she doesn't have from the first husband. So they say, well, yeah, in fact, that's true. And I already told you this, so it's review. Ah, what really this bright is telling you is number one, in a case where the first husband doesn't have money, she gets a ketubah from the second husband. But, but there's a certain case where even from the Abam she won't get, which is our case. Okay, so therefore they're contrasting in the bright of the two cases, and that's why the word afilu is used. Okay, that was question number one. So question number one is, Shnia labal, not to the Abam, she's permitted to the Abam. Will she get a ketubah from the second husband? No. Second question. Again, we're still not getting to our real question, which is why is there this difference in the ketubah? Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Yochanan the following question. If you remember in the Mishnah, it said just they had get ketuba. What about Mizono? What is Mizono? Mizono is as long as they're married, she gets food every day for sustenance. Remember, she gives him her whatever she works for, right? Any job, any income she brings in. And in, and in place of that, he gives her food. So now, we have an issue. Does she get mezonored or not? So first the Gemara says, what case are you talking about? Let's clarify. Remember what's supposed to happen. Amana marries a Kohen Gadol or any of these forbidden Kohen marriages. Basically, they're supposed to get divorced. So comes the Gemara and says, If she's married to him right now, we're certainly not going to give her Mizono. The law is he's supposed to divorce her. We want to cut off any connection between them. So Mizono keeps them interconnected because she works, gives him his, her income, and he provides her with sustenance. That's just going to keep them connected and married to each other. We want to get rid of this marriage, dissolve it. So certainly not. So they say Lotzricha, it's a case where they're not, they're married, but they're not exactly married. They're not living together. Lotzricha shalach hu hayam. He went abroad left her behind. Ve love tava achla. She needed food. So what'd she do? She borrowed money and ate food, right? Imagine in those days, right? The husband goes off. Maybe he had some money at home. We don't know, but she didn't have access to it. He left her without anything. So she went 
maybe she doesn't have a way to work or not enough to get her food. So she borrowed money and now, generally, if that happens, the husband's required to pay back the loan. The question is, here am I? Is he required or not? Do we say, again, the two sides, Mizone tnai ketuba ninu, midi'i ketuba, ile mizono. Does mizono go hand in hand with ketuba? Since she gets her ketuba money, in this case, right, she is, when he divorces her, she'll get her ketuba. So maybe she gets mizonoed as well, because it's part of the conditions of the ketuba. Or do we say, O Dilma, ketuba dila mishkalu mefak a'itle? Now, the ketuba is a one lump sum thing. Therefore, right, what's going to happen? He's going to divorce her. She's going to get it. But the mezone, dilma te'akev gabe, leitla. But since the mezono basically keeps them connected, we're worried that if we for, we require him to pay mezono, they might stay married to each other. So therefore, maybe we penalize her and don't give her mezono, even though they really are a stipulation within the ketuba. Again, you see this desire of them to kind of make sure that this marriage doesn't continue. Because first of all, what's going to happen? It's going to create more halalim, right? The longer they stay married, the more, even if he's abroad, eventually he'll come back. And if, right? So we, we want to just disconnect them. So the question is, does it matter if he's abroad or not? So now, Amrle Leila, he says she doesn't get Mizono. So now they question him and they say, right, Rabbi Lezer asked, Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, don't. Doesn't get mazono. But there's a bright that says she gets mazono. So how do you deal with that? Kitanya, he answers, oh, that, la'achamita. Now, there's two ways you get mazono. One is, as I said, while you're married. The second is, and I explained to you that a ketubah is a lump sum fee. We're going to see this a lot more when we get to Masechet Ketubah, which is our next Masechet. A woman generally gets this one lump sum fee when they get divorced. But, she can opt for getting Mizono payments, okay? She can get payments for food every month until such time that she demands her ketubah. In other words, as long as she doesn't demand her lump sum ketubah, or we'll see, there's de debates whether once she starts wearing makeup or starts dating or starts right, looking for someone else or potentially in a serious relationship with somebody else, then already she loses her rights because she can't keep claiming money from one husband when she's kind of moving to the next. So there's a question about where we draw that line. But assuming she's not somewhere on that line, she can still get Mizono payments. So they say, so let's say the husband dies, then she could get Mizono because they're not married anymore. We don't have to worry about them staying together. He's dead. In that case, she could get Mizono. Okay? That's because it's part of the Ketubah. So that's how he explains that contradictory bright. And again, we're going to see, we're going to say now say Tanu Rabbanan. And here we're going to go more, uh, sorry, I skipped something. Now, Ita Amar, this is, okay, there's another way of reading this, which is Amar Le Tanya Yeshla, okay, where it started with, there's a bride that says she gets Mizono, and then he tried to say she gets Mizono. Ha, Bamo Vahotsekai, and then they say, no, but wait, how could she get Mizono if he's supposed to divorce her? Ela Ha Tanya Yeshla, but they say, but, right, we're, we're stuck. On the one hand, we want them to get divorced. On the other hand, the bride says she gets mizono. So, kitanya yilach harmita. And then they answer it in the same way. The bride that says she gets mizono is only after death. Okay. Tanu Rabana. Now we have a bride that goes more in depth. Finally, we're going to get to this difference. Why does she get a ketuba? Right? It was a little hard to learn that whole suga without really understanding the basics here. Why does she get a ketuba from an almanah, the queen gadol relationship? But when it comes to um, uh, a shniot, a derabanan issue, she doesn't get a ketuba. So, Almantana Rabbanan, Almanala Kohen Gadol, Grushava Chalutzala Kohen Idiot. Notice these are just Kohen relationships. In the Mishnah, when they talked about this, they also mentioned the Mamzer and Nitin cases, which are not mentioned here in the Brita, which we're going to see later. Maybe that's significant. Anyway, it says here, Yeshla Ktuba, Perot, Mizonot, Blaot. Okay, this, by the way, is the Brita where it says she gets Mizonot. Okay? So she gets all those things that in the other case they don't get. Vihip Sula. She becomes a halala. Okay, a woman who marries a kohen who she can't marry, she becomes a halala. Uvlada pasul, and her offspring become halalim. Ve kofino tolhotzi, and we force them to divorce her. They can't stay married. Next case, shnio midivre sofrim. The opposite, ein la ktuba lo pero lo mezono lo blaot vehi kshera uvlada kasher. So everything is the opposite except for the last line, which is kofino tolhotzi. Also, he has to divorce her, but. She doesn't get her too, but she doesn't get all those extras. I'm not going to go through them again. We went through them yesterday. And she's not disqualified from anything. And the Vlad is kasher. 
any child born from this union is fine. They're not disqualified for any reason. Here comes the reason. Okay, in this Brita, there's a reason. We're going to have two reasons given in the Brita. One is Rabbi Shem ben Elazar, one is Rebbe, and then there's going to be this Tavar Acher, which is going to somehow be modifying one of the two opinions. Here comes our question. Why does she get a Ketubah? Comes and he says something that really doesn't make a lot of sense yet. Amana the Kohen Gadol, right? She's Pasul and he's disqualified. Now he is a little bit tricky who the he is. The he could be the Kohen himself because he can't work as a Kohen anymore. But it's a little tricky because he actually, on a Torah level, he's not disqualified. Only the child is disqualified and the wife, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. He doesn't really become disqualified. In the end, the rabbis say he can't work in the temple. But theoretically, some people explain, Rabbi Hananel explains that the who is the Vlad. And it actually makes a little more sense going forward that it's it's her and her offspring, okay? Because we're going to think that her offspring are much closer to her anytime that she and her offspring will be disqualified. Again, there are some who say it's he and her, okay? So there's two ways to understand it. We're now on Amabet. We consim otoktuba. Now, it's not really a knas, okay? Knas is a penalty. Now, any marriage, the husband commits the ktuba to the wife. So basically, what we're saying is status quo remains. He is penalized in the sense that he has to pay the ketubah. Okay, we're going to see. We don't really understand why yet. Okay, so hold off because I don't want to kind of give it all away. We're going to see it inside. So why the Dorabanans don't get, right, the, the rabbinic uh, arayot? Right, he's not disqualified. She's not disqualified. Again, the who could be maybe the offspring is not disqualified. They penalized her that she doesn't get her ketubah money. Okay, we're going to have to see why in one more minute. Rebbe Omer, halalu divrei Torah, v'divrei Torah ain't shrichim chizuk. Halalu divrei sofrim, v'divrei sofrim, shrichim chizuk. Rebbe explains it very, very simply. When it comes to rabbinic law, we're always worried people aren't going to take it seriously. So, we're going to institute some penalty. Now, what's weird about this whole thing is, Penalty on her becomes reward for him. Penalty on him becomes reward for her, right? So it's a little tricky because someone's going to be penalized and someone's going to win win out here because it's just money. It's going either from one hand to another or not moving hands. So the whole thing is a little bit strange to say this, but he says the rabbis wanted to deter people from doing going against rabbinic law because they thought people weren't going to take it seriously. So therefore they say we're going to change the status quo. Normally, you get a ketubah from this marriage. This time, you're not going to get a ketubah. Now, of course, the husband gets rewarded in this case, so it's a little bit, right? He doesn't have to pay the money, but that's his distinction. And Rebbe says, and um, when it comes to Torah law, though, everybody knows it's forbidden, so we don't need to penalize her for doing this because it's obvious it's us. Or so she did something wrong, but it doesn't mean she's going to lose her rights to, you know, when it comes to the marriage, she has certain rights. And there's Let's just put it this way. Once you say Kiddushin Tosim, remember, in Chai Lavim, we say, unless you're Rabbi Akiva, Kiddushin or Kiddushin. You did something wrong, but it's a marriage. So once it's a marriage, everything about marriage applies. So that's Rebbe. Now, Davar Achel. Zehu Margila. Zehu Margilatam. Now, this is going to explain a little bit better. First, they're going to say this is coming to explain Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar. Okay, but before we understand, let's just explain the words, and then we'll read on and we'll understand this better. When it's said, right, we're going to penalize, now again, this is going to have a much better explanation why one gets penalized and not the other. The question is, who is the motivator here? Who pushed the marriage through? Okay, so he says, in one case, it's him, and that's why we're going to penalize him. In the other case, it's her, and that's why we're going to penalize her. So, Davar Acherman Katanila, who, who is the Tana of this Davar Acher? So Ikeda Amar, the first explanation is Rabbi Shema ben Elazar Katanila. Umatam Kamar. He came, he used this to explain his own opinion. And now we're going to finally understand his opinion. So let's read it. Matam Amru Hu Pasul Vihi Psula Kansu Otoktuba. If he's disqualified and she's disqualified. Now here the Rabbeinu Hanal makes a lot more sense. If she's disqualified and her offspring is disqualified, then we're going to assume who is the motivator of this. Mipnesha Hu Margila. He must be the one. What woman would would push a relationship? It's, it's very interesting. It's in terms of we want to figure out who put, we're going to assume 
one person was more strong than the other. Who pushed the relationship through? It must have been him because why would she want to enter into a relationship where she's going to become disqualified? Her offspring are going to be disqualified. She's not going to want to do that. Okay? If you say he's disqualified and she's disqualified, you're still going to say that therefore she wasn't the one who pushed it through because, because even if it's just her versus him, she has to worry about her offspring. Why he's not worried about the offspring is, a, is another good question. There's a lot of questions that could be asked on this sugi in general. But, and again, you have to remember, sometimes these are cases where the, it's clear the distinction existed and everyone tries to come up with a creative way of its understanding and each one really has weaknesses. We'll see Rebbe's weakness in another minute. Um, so now he says this, but matam hu kasher v'ikshera, if she, we'll put it in these words, she has nothing to lose. What, what, what's going to hurt her? Nothing happens to her. She did something wrong, right? In the Shniot. So she went against rabbinic law, but there's no ramifications to her actions. Then we're going to assume katsuo taktuba. Then we're going to penalize her. Okay. And even if you say in the first case, hu pasul v'hipsula, they're equal, but again, status quo remains. Which at least she'll get her ketuba. But here we're going to say, now here also some of the commentaries push in this issue, which in the Gemara talks a lot about women always want to get married more than men. So if there's no, no ramifications at all, we're going to assume that she was the motivator because she always, anyway, she's in general more pushing to get married than the man is. So if all things being equal, we'll assume it's her who pushed things through. Okay, so that's the explanation. Now, Ikeda Amr, some people say, Rebbe Katamila. Really, this is in Rebbe's opinion, which is why. Well, Rebbe distinguished Joraita de Rabban. What does it have to do with who motivated the marriage and who pushed it through? Chalutzaka Kashyale. Remember, Rebbe distinguished Joraita de Rabbanans. But wait a minute. Really, the distinction was Kwanim cases versus de Rabbanan cases, right? The rabbinic Shniot. But Chalutza. A Kohen can't marry a chalutza. It doesn't say so in the Torah. It's only by rabbinic law. Because the rabbis treated someone who went under when chalitza like a divorcee. So chalutza is only rabbinic. So when this davar acher came in, it was to explain specifically the example of the chalutza and why that's an exception to the rule. Because really it's rabbinic. So theoretically she shouldn't get a ketubah. So why does she get a ketubah? Ah, ha chalutza de rabbanan ve'it la ketubah. So how could that be? So hadar amar, he explained, kevan de pasula. Midurabanan, since she becomes disqualified from eating truma on a Durabanan level and she becomes a Khalala on a Durabanan level, therefore, what does it mean it disqualifies her from eating truma? What if it, it means she can never eat truma in the future? We learned this a bunch of Dapim ago that once you marry someone who's forbidden to you, even if later on you marry a Kohen in a permitted manner, you wouldn't be allowed to eat truma ever. Or if you're a Bak Kohen, you can never go back to your father's house. So, in that case, how do we explain? Since she's going to be disqualified from eating truma forever, clearly she's not the motivator here. And that then we bring in this other explanation. Zehu margila, zohi margila to. So it all depends on who is the motivator. And in the Chalitza case, we're going to assume she wasn't the motivator. So now comes the big question, which is going to take us almost to the bottom of the daf, and we'll get to the new Mishnah. My ika ben Rebbe, the Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Assuming we're going with the first interpretation and that the who is the motivator is Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Rebbe is to write to Rabbanan. What will be practical ramifications? And we're going to have five explanations. In four of them, we're going to first, we're going to reject each of them based on a particular opinion. We're going to say, well, according to this person's opinion, that really won't be a nafkamina. A nafkamina is always, what's a, what's a case where there'll be a practical difference whether you say this or that. So Amar of Chista Mamzeret Unatina Lisraeli Kabenai. Remember, I pointed out that in this Brighta, the Mamzeret Unatina didn't come up, even though they appeared in our Mishnah. So that's because maybe it would be a nafkamina between them. Manda Amar de Oraita, that's Rebbe Hanami de Oraita. It's a Torah issue. So again, she would get her too, but it would be with them all. Manda Amar Mipneshi Himargila, Ha, he, uh, Shehumargila. If you say, what's the reason she doesn't lose her ketubah because he was the motivator in the Kohanim cases because she becomes a chalala and her children, well, ha, he margalale. In a mamzerid and Nitina case, she's clearly the motivator. Why? She's disqualified from marrying a Yisrael, but he, right, um, she can't marry a Yisrael. She can only marry a mamzer, and her children will always be mamzerim. So why is she marrying this Yisrael? Well, he clearly has no motivation to marry a mamzerid. He's got his pick and choose of anyone he wants to marry. But she pushes it. Why does she push it? Well, there's a halacha that there's a way l'tahir mamzerim. And there's actually a machloket about it. We'll get to the other opinion in a minute. But she could have a mamzer child. So she wants to get married because she wants to have a mamzer child so she could fix her future. How so? 
if he marries a shifcha, a female maidservant, okay, she can't do this because she can't marry a shifcha, but if, if she were to have a son, he could marry a shifcha, their children would be avadim, because it goes by the mother, by the maidservant. They'll be avadim kanani, right? We're talking about Canaanite slaves. And then if the owner frees them, they can now be Jewish. So that's a way to do it, and that's the motivating factor for her to marry this, this Yisrael, and that's why it must be she was the motivator and she would be penalized. Even though, according to Rebbe, she wouldn't be because it's to Oraita. Ula Rebbe Liezer, the Amar, her is the evidence there. But wait a minute. Rebbe Liezer says, and yes, people do try to suggest using this. Yes, people did suggest, Rav Goren, I think, was the one who, who made a big suggestion many years ago that we should try to do this to get rid of the mom's hair issue, for sure. Now, Rebbe Liezer says, Harvez Eved and Mamzer. He disagrees and says, no, no, no. The kid has two statuses, Eved and Mamzer. So it won't help him to free him. So that's not an Afgamina, according to Rebbe Liezer. Amalei Rav Yosef, second one. Machzir Gushato Mishenisait Ikabenayu, right? If he returns a divorced wife once she was with somebody else. So Manda Amar Do Olaita and Amida Olaita. It's by Torah law. But Manda Amar Mepneshi Himar Humar Gila Ha Himar Gilale. Now in a Machzir Gushato case, she doesn't become disqualified from anything. The child doesn't become disqualified. So again, we're going to assume she's the motivator. Ula Rabbi, and that why, that's why it would be an Afgamina. Ula Rabbi Akiva Damal Yesh Mamzir Mechaive Lavin. But here comes the rejection. According to Rabbi Akiva, there's even a mom's there from Chayve Lavin, which means her kids will be a mom's there, according to Rabbi Akiva, which means she's not going to want to do this relationship, and it must be him. Ha lomer galei right? She clearly is not going to be motivating this relationship, and then it will be the same. El Amar of Papa, third option. Be'ula l'kohen gadol ikabenayu. If you don't want a lotase, because a lotase is always going to become mamzerim, right? So how about a mitzvah ase, a bitul ase, not doing a positive commandment. What's the positive commandment? A Kohen Gadol is commanded to marry a woman who is a bitula, who is a virgin. So what if he marries a bitula? It's not a lotase, so the kids won't be mamzerim even according to Rabbi Akiva. But, right, so again, it's still Torah law, so she's going to get her ketubah. The one who said with the Kohen and the Almana, or the Kohen and the divorcee, it's because he motivated the relationship. Well, in this case, ha it must be she motivated it because there was no nothing wrong, nothing's going to happen to her. Ula Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov, Damar Yesh Chalal Michai Ve'ase, but again comes the rejection. Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov holds even in this case the kids are Chalalim. Ha Lo Mergalale Vilomidi. She's definitely not right. She'll become a Chalala. The kids will become Chalalim. She's definitely not going to want that. So that's not enough Gamina according to that opinion. Option number four. We're almost at the end here. El Amar of Ashi Machzir Safek Sotato Ikabinai. If he accuses his woman of being a sota and then he ends up sleeping with her before she gets convicted or not, we don't know, she's still a suffix, then it's forbidden me to oraita for him to do this. So man da amar da oraita, anami da oraita. Man da amar me pnei shuhu margila, ha he margila le. We're going to assume she did it because, again, nothing is going to be worse for her by doing this. Right? The children don't become amzerim or anything. Ula Rabbi Mati ben Charash, but again comes the rejection. Da Amal, Afilu halach ba'ala l'ashkota u'ba'ala abaderech asa azona. Okay, he slept with her on the way, then she becomes a zona. So that does mess her up. Ha lomer galay velomidi. According to his opinion, no, she's definitely not going to be the one to motivate this. In which case, it won't be a practical difference between them. Finally, we get to the end of this section. Ella. A convicted woman who's a convicted sota has nothing to lose, basically. So that would be a nafkamina. On a trauma level, if she sleeps with her husband, it will be forbidden. But on a, if we go by Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, right, again, then she'll get her ketuba because it was do right to law, it was forbidden. According to Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, she has nothing to lose here, and since she has nothing to lose, she's obviously the one motivating the relationship. And then she would basically lose her ketubah when, according to Rebbe, she would get her ketubah. Those were all five potential nafgaminas. Again, each one, based on one person's opinion, it won't work, but it would work for other opinions. Okay, last thing for today, we're going to learn this new Mishnah, which is actually, of again, just like the previous Mishnah, it's a review of things we already learned. Ba'i Yisrael Mu'lesa the Kohen. We're going to have a few situations where we have a, a Israelite woman who's either engaged to a Kohen. If you remember, we learned... She can't get eat truma because we're worried she's going to bring the food back to her house. Okay, there were two reasons. We'll just go with that one right now. Mi'uberet mi'kohen, if she's pregnant from a kohen. So then, she might have a child with the kohen, but we don't know yet. And if she doesn't have any other children, that doesn't allow her to eat truma because now he's dead. 
And Shomer Yabam, the Kohen, if her husband died, and now she's supposed to do Yibam with his brother, she's in between Kohanim, she's not allowed to eat Truma. And Chem Bat Kohen Yisrael. A bat kohen to Yisrael and all those relationships, once she gets engaged, she can no longer go back to her father's house because she has to be kinurea, not engaged, not pregnant. And, uh, oh no, so, sorry. It was, I, may, I said the wrong thing. Bat Yisrael, I explained by accident by the bat kohen. The bat kohen can't, when she's engaged, can't eat in her own house because we're worried she's going to bring truma food back home. And, no, one second. No, I said it right. Bat, Yis, bat kohen. Right, no, a bat kohen li Yisrael, sorry. A bat kohen li Yisrael can't eat truma when she's engaged because she's already left her father's house somewhat, right? She's already not connected. And I said it right before, sorry, I got confused right now. A bat Yisrael, mu, and, uh, and if she's mu'uberet, so maybe she's going to have a child with the Yisrael, which permits her, right, she can't go back. She can only go back. Kine ureha, like she was in her youth, not pregnant. And shomeret yabam, to a Yisrael, she's still got zika, connection to the, Yisrael family, that prevents her from going back home. Likewise, the exact same thing by Yisrael Mureset Levi. The Levim eat Maser, and all the same rules apply according to our Mishnah. Mu, right, so if she's Mureset Levi, she can't yet eat Maser. If she's Mureset Levi, he dies and she's pregnant, can't eat Maser anymore. Shomeret Yabam Levi, she's supposed to yibam with the Levi brother of the other Levi, she can't eat Trumer, uh, Maser. The chaim bat Levi to Yisrael, and same thing about Levi to Yisrael can't go back home and eat maser in her father's house in these situations. Lo tochal b'maser. What if you have a Levi and a coin together? A bat Levi mu'reset the coin, or mu'beret mi coin, or shemer yaban the coin. Bechaim bat coin the Levi. Lo tochal lo betruma v'lo b'maser. Okay, all these women are basically stuck. They can't do anything. To which the Gemara is going to ask, and we'll stop here. Is a bat? Why can't? Uh, someone who's engaged to a levy eat maser, whoever said there's a problem with eating maser for a non-levy. There is no such thing, or maybe there is. That's what we're going to see tomorrow. It's definitely not like truma, so why is she forbidden to eat maser? We will talk about that tomorrow. Have a chodesh tov and a great day, everybody.